Hello, everybody. Welcome to the pre-Super Bowl Sunday live stream. I just want to put a little quick video out uh, just because uh, not much to do until the big game starts. So uh, I thought I would just uh, put a little information out to kind of tease what's going on. So we're going to take a look at today. A lot of things to go over. So let's just jump right in. The thing was, is last week we talked about that the whole synopsis was this. Why are people on the sidelines right now waiting? Now, this was probably the most bullish type of video I put out. I'm not a very uh, usual, monstrously bullish person. And people took note of that and said, hey, is this the top? Because if Rob's bullish, this doesn't sound right. And what we talked about, I said, look, before a having, this is like the perfect time to be in, in the place. So for you being here, of course, I always say you're in the right place at the right time. So we took a look at a couple of different uh, pieces of information, took a look at a couple of charts, DCA, and just the four-year cycles in general. And what we really came up to is this. If you would have invested lump sum, mostly lump sum, but we did some DCA. If you would have done that before the actual having, you'd be way, way ahead. Now, that doesn't mean that it's going to happen like that. But last week, I was like, this is what I would do. And this is, I told you what I, you know, I said, hey, I I put a big, uh, not a big, but a, a lump sum of some cash that I kind of kind of hanging around. I didn't go all in. The big difference between lump sum and going all in. But I put a big chunk in. We'll just say that. Because I'm like, hey, you know, we're before the having, what the hell are we waiting for? So we, uh, it was Pretty good video. We've had 34K on this one. And of course, in the Q&A, we had over, uh, no, 39K on this one and and 14K. So about 50K people you know, watch it. And how do we do? Well, obviously, we did pretty good, right? I mean, over the last seven days, just Bitcoin itself is up almost 12%. So not a bad time. We could have gone the other way. But that's what we talked about in the video. We said, look, I mean, there's a good chance you can go down 30 40%, just like we did in the last pre-having. Remember March of 2020? When we had the uh, Cervasa sickness come around, yeah, you lost big or you were down big. You didn't lose anything unless you actually sold. So I said, just be aware of that. And in the, so far, it's actually worked out. So the question then is become, well, why so bullish? Look, when I got in 2017, we didn't have these factors. Like this is from Cointelegraph. It's a great piece in it. And they just did the, the X's and O's and the numbers. They said there's the total inflow into spot Bitcoin ETFs. And people have already sold you know, this many times, but I, it can't be underscored. The total inflow into spot Bitcoin ETFs has already exceeded $2.1 since the launch on January 11th. And I was taking a look at it. I thought, I thought Grayscale Bit, uh, the, uh, yeah, the Grayscale uh, Bitcoin Trust, which is now an ETF, um, I had, I was under the assumption I was wrong that, uh, the outflows from them exceeded the inflows, but that's not the case in all, in all honesty. And we can see that IBIT, BlackRock, FBC, BitB, ARK, all those guys, these are the inflows. Everything's positive except for Grayscale, which we knew because of, of course, uh, FTX had a lot of things stuck on there and people were not too happy about the fees. So they unloaded and that's fine. But the total for most of the day has been pretty damn positive. 16 January is negative, negative here on 18. And you, you know, you can read, I don't need to do this for you. But I mean, for total right there, 2.1 billion uh, total in uh, for the uh, for the ETF. So when we're taking a look at it, I'm like, okay, that's pretty great. And we're going in the right direction now. Grayscale seems to be slowing down somewhat, although they had a you know 102 drop off uh, the eighth, but it's actually reducing from the high, I think of, uh, geez, Louise, I think there was one day, 641, uh, 22nd of January. So that's looking pretty good. And then of course, I have always said this, that I felt like we got screwed out of a proper bull run in 2021 because of these two clowns, uh, Mashinsky and, uh, Sam scam freed. And, uh, now things are coming to light. This is from Crypto News. FTX CEO uh, SBF is ordered to appear in court amidst the Celsius connection probe. So again, everything that, that happens negatively happens in the bull market, at the peak of the bull market. That's where everybody believed in FTX. That's where everybody believed in Alex Mashinsky and Celsius, myself included. Also Voyager, also BlockFi, take your pick. Everything really that gets screwed up happens at the peak of the bull run, right? When we're going through the bear market, that's when you, you figure out who's actually here, who actually can build and actually move forward. So again, I think this next bull run is going to be massive. 
I think there's not as much shenanigans as there was under wraps. And I think we're, again, the right place, right time. So what's the problem? What's the problem with Bitcoin as I put out on my on the thumbnail? The problem with Bitcoin is this, is we've got a lot of experts, so-called experts, and they gave like the worst financial advice ever. Now, I can't give, I can't give financial advice on, on, this, on this show. I'm not a financial advisor. No problem for everybody else to say, you know, do this and buy this and get this. For some reason, it's like no big deal. On top of that, you've got the Peter Zions, you got the Kramers, and you got the shifts out there just going, don't buy this asset. And they have screwed people over so bad by not allowing them to, not a lot in the line, but just giving them horrible advice and not really looking at all angles. And that's fine. That's just, you know, par for the course. That's really what it really comes down to. But it is an issue. And it's been it's been an issue. I sometimes I can't forgive people because like even Schiff has been saying this since 2012, when he didn't have a white hair on his head. And gold has roughly stayed the same. Of course, it's gone like over 2000. So congratulations, gold holders. I actually gold, hold gold as well. So great. But then you got guys like Peter Zihan, you know, and he's you know big everywhere in the social media. I actually like listening to him. I, I don't I think he's a smart guy. I mean, geopolitical conversations, he's, he's really on top of it. But when he gives stuff about uh, economics and, and talks about this, it's just ridiculous. So I'm going to just play this clip. I know most of you have heard this, but it's always good to kind of reminisce and go down memory lane to listen to these so-called experts who sound very smart, but are giving the worst advice possible to everybody else out there. And not only is it bad advice, but it's at the worst possible time. Listen to the actual numbers that he brings up and tell me if, uh, if that's uh, something that you would uh, <laughs> tell people and have no problems with. Anyhow, take a listen. It's about a minute and a half. No intrinsic value to this asset. Mm. And now it's starting to be priced appropriately. So it has a, you know, what's Bitcoin at? 16,000? It has another 17,000 to go down. Duh. Really? Yeah. There, there's no intrinsic value to this product. And do you think that people just inherently like lost faith in the idea behind crypto because of FTX? Well, it's, because of it became an ideology. And whenever you invest based on an ideology, you're going to make some decisions that are a little divorced from math. And how, what do you mean by ideology? Well, they're, the people who really like crypto are convinced that it's the currency of the future and that a decentralized ledger is the way to go and that anything that is controlled by a government entity is by definition a negative. And if it's done by the private sector freely, it will be better. And that's just not how currency works. Currency is a method of exchange and a store of value. And for that, there has to be a degree of trust and you have to have it managed in terms of volume. I mean, one of the, the craziest things about Bitcoin uh, is that there will never be more than X number of units of Bitcoin. Well, by default, that means it can't be used for trade because the whole idea of economic activity is that there's expansion which means you need more currency to lubricate and manage that expansion. If currency is locked into a specific number, you get monetary inflation. And that is one of the fastest ways to destroy an economic model. So because of the... <laughs> yeah, monetary inflation. It's a good thing we don't do that here. Ooh, that was close. So, I mean, not to beat a dead horse. And again, Zion, I have no problems with him. He just, you know, leads people, leads people astray. But the thing that he talked about there is he said, you know, like... He pretty much said like it's a cult status type of thing. Look, look, cult status type of things for businesses work out pretty well. Have you ever been to CrossFit? These guys are crazy and they love it. And guess what? Huge booming business. Uh, and for some reason, when a new Apple phone comes out, everybody's lined up around the corner to get this stupid new phone that really just is another big camera. And then when he talks about that, you know, Bitcoin can't be a monetary currency. Look, I personally don't think it's it's a great currency. Uh, piece, especially right now with the, you know, the, the rates being so high. Now, of course, everybody's going to scream and go, what about lighting? What about light? Yes, you can use lighting. I get it. Right. But as far as like, I find it as actually a good store of value. And I do find it as a pretty decent uh, hedge against inflation, especially with the, the amount of money printing out there. If you go to this website, uh, price in Bitcoin 21.com, and you take a look at what the average house was just in 2019, roughly 330,000. It would take you like around 60, 58 something Bitcoin to buy that house back in 2019. Now moving forward, if you did the same thing right now, 
the house is around four hundred eighteen thousand dollars. Guess what? How much it costs you? Costs you less than ten Bitcoin. So again, this is one of those issues with people that just like they sound smart in one sector, but they just kind of miss the boat uh, on the other. And again, um, not to say anything negative, but it just it leads people astray, and it's a problem. But I can't blame them, and I'm going to tell you why. It takes a long time to understand it. Because when you look at it, you're like, this doesn't make any sense, you know, until you really do the do the research. Larry Fink did the research, works out pretty well for him in BlackRock. But you know who else did some research? Michael Saylor. And let me remind everybody, one of the biggest evangelicals said this in 2013, Bitcoin days are numbered. It seems like just a matter of time before it suffers the same fate as online gambling. So again, and there's still hope for these people. I just would like them to get on board a little bit faster, especially with this new... Uh, bull run coming in. But hey, I could be wrong. And then also, one of the other thing about the problems with Bitcoin is you got people like, again, Dan Pena. I'm going to have you listen to this. This guy's a little out there, but uh, he's made billions in the oil industry. And of course, he's looked up to as a pretty savvy investor. And he said something interesting. And I thought to myself, I get it of why this would be an issue, but I'm going to tell you why it's not an issue. So just taking a listen to uh, Dan for a second, about 40 seconds or so, and he's going to tell you why uh, his insider information of what of what Bitcoin is. Again, problem with Bitcoin is essentially these guys. If you knew who was really behind Bitcoin, really behind Bitcoin, you would run as fast as you fucking could to sell it. I know. 100%. If you knew who owned Bitcoin or who started Bitcoin, you and you had Bitcoin, you couldn't sleep at night. I know. 100%. And when the real founder of Bitcoin comes out, it is my humble opinion, and there's nothing humble about me, Bitcoin will go to fucking zero. Monday. And uh, microseconds, whoop, like that. I love those. I love those pieces with the uh, with the uh, music in the background. It's pretty pretty nice. So I always appreciate Dan's take, uh, and of course he's always there to tell you that uh, you can't think for yourself. He knows. He he needs to tell you because you don't have the insider information that he knows of everything that's going on, and things are actually going to unfortunately lead to the collapse of Bitcoin. And I thought about it. I thought about Dan. I said, I just put this this question out on, on X. Said, who would be the worst person to be the creator or founder of Bitcoin? And even if it was that person, could that even that one person or persons stop it at this point? Because again, Zion, I, I know I'm saying his name wrong, so everybody can can correct me. Peter, we'll just say. When he gave this information, he's, this was around when Bitcoin was around 16 grand. So this was roughly the beginning of 2023, end of 2022, essentially the bottom, and telling people not to buy it. Horrible, horrible advice. This video, if I'm not mistaken, was around 2018, 2019. When well, it was even lower than that, we're talking about three, five, seven thousand dollars $7,000. Awful, awful advice. So I asked the question. And uh, uh, Vanessa has a good one. She goes, 1 million Bitcoin sell pressure could sure hurt it. Now she's talking about the uh, Nakamoto wallet, which gets in a second. My conspiracy theory is that it was created by the NSA. And this is a long con to assure the USA will remain solvent forever. The, con the coins will move when they need it to move. If this is the case, I won't be mad. I just said, yeah, I mean, that could somewhat make sense. But if the US government did do it, it'd be a perfect play. Because if they want to maintain the US dollar reserve currency, and they want to, what they would do is just hold on to that Bitcoin and they would back the dollar with said Bitcoin and they would keep their place in the global economy. It's perfect. So in that situation, I was like, this is fantastic. And then of course, some people would say like, they gave me some pretty good uh, answers. Uh, NSA again, damn someone said it was Jerry Ep Epstein's wallets. Maybe so, deep state, maybe Putin, who knows, <laughs> whatever. But the whole thing comes out of this. Even if it was, gosh, I don't know. Let's say it's Epstein. I don't know. Let, no, let's say it's Vladimir Putin. And he created Bitcoin, right? Could he even stop it right now? Well, no, not really. I mean, at, at this point, it's kind of ridiculous. So number of Bitcoin out there, 
This is from Bitcoin Treasuries. Buy bitcoinworldwide.com forward slash treasury. Link in the description. Did you know ETFs are almost at, it's almost at 5%. ETFs own almost a million Bitcoin in roughly what? Three weeks? I don't know how long it's been uh, for these ETFs to go through. Correct me in the comment section. 4%, almost 5 You know it's going to be 10% in no time flat. That's scary. Countries of 2%, public 1.3, private 2, and 0.19. And of course, you can look at, so where the heck did it all go? Well, just like Vanessa was commenting, she's like, what about Satoshi's wallet? And we all hear that, that wallet, 1 million Satoshi wallet. Well, it's not that simple, actually. There's a great website, Coin Codex, and it takes a look at Satoshi Nakamoto's wallets. And this was actually spread out because why would Satoshi just keep one wallet? That's not what uh, he was preaching. Of course, you know, privacy, you'd probably want to move things around. So this is where they think there's a number of wallets that could be Satoshi Nakamoto's. No one's really for sure. Some people also say that, you know, there's also the Hal Finney address who some people think that might be uh, Satoshi, but no one knows. But even Hal Finney's Bitcoin address has a balance of 18.43 Bitcoin, which is still pretty good. It's under a million, but still. And then to get down to the nitty gritty, I didn't realize this because I've been hearing the whole thing of like, it's a wallet, it's a million. It's a wallet, it's a million. Not so fast. So researcher Sergio Damian Lerner, I think I nailed it, estimated that Satoshi Nakamoto would mine approximately 1.1 million Bitcoin. Lerner came to this estimate by identifying a pattern in the way Bitcoin blocks were being mined in the era when Satoshi was active. Satoshi pattern allowed him to differentiate between blocks likely but not definitive, mined by Satoshi and blocks, likely mined with a high degree of confidence. However, Bitcoin estimates vary. BitMEX research said in 2018 that it could be between 600,000 and 700,000. No one knows. And it's more likely to be accurate that the 1.1 million Bitcoin estimate is not as accurate as we think it is. So that made me go down to this rabbit hole, which would be into the block. Great website, a lot of data analytics, fantastic. And two things came struck at me is that this, which is the big thing, right? first of all, holders making money of the current price. You know, 91% of people are in the money for Bitcoin. What do you think that's going to do for the, for the bull market? If you're in the money at this point, right, you don't really need to sell. And the narrative is there that there's this halving coming. And guess what happens after the halving? Well, in roughly 12 to 14 months, we see some major price appreciation. So maybe you don't want to sell too much. You're going to have to get people that sell. But again, I know people say the four-year cycle has nothing to do with it. The having has nothing to do with it. I disagree. I think it's the narrative is more powerful than what people believe. So I'm not sure, but I could be wrong. So that's the first part. And then also there's a great stat here for all ownership stats. So we click on that. Where is all this Bitcoin? Well, there's whales. There's two of them. And they own 450,000 Bitcoin again. If Satoshi does have 1.1, that would dwarf that one, but it's a, it's a combination of different wallets. 40 investors own almost 9% or 1.75. And of course, mixed in that would probably be some of the uh, centralized exchanges uh, holding that Bitcoin for us and moving forward. But this is the big thing, retail volume. Retail volume is almost 89%. Essentially, it's in the hands of the people. Now, we can break that down. We can take a look at those who's are whales, who are shrimp, who are whatever the heck the other uh, ocean views are. But we can just say that with a high degree of certainty, there it is pretty well decentralized across wallets. So I'm not too concerned about what Dan Ping thinks, that it's going to go to zero, even if Vladimir Putin comes on and goes, surprise, I made it. Nobody cares, because at this point, you can't really stop it. And that's the... Uh, essentially the piece of it, which leads me to this last point, which is this. Uh, this was a tweet I put out on January 22nd. And I said, look, when everything was going on, in the, it was Bitcoin was below 40,000, it was down 6%. And I said, dump it, dump it on me. I'll buy those bags. Don't complain when it goes up 10X and I unload on you. That's how this works as I take the risk. And that's what we all did, right? We all went through this crappy bear market, which is where all the millionaires are made. So I don't want to hear any crying from anybody else, especially the new rookies that come in, the tourists, and like, why, why are you dumping on me? Well, it's because I did the hard work while you were too scared to listen to those moron experts. <laughs> and I was doing my job. 
So on that note, there are some rules underneath me, right? It's all gone. Don't invest more than you can afford to lose. Everything's a scam until proved otherwise, 100% scams. Don't leave anything on exchanges. Voyager, Celsius, FTX, Mt. Gox, BlockFi, you name it. Don't use leverage and take profits. And I said this very clearly. I know people will say, well, what are you talking about? Just like when someone says, I, I said last week, put a lump sum in. And people were saying, so you went all in? Like with all your money? No. Lump sum is not, I'm going all in. I sold my kids and my kidneys and everything else. I just went. It's a lump sum. Whether that is like, if you do $10 a day, maybe you went in a oh, hundred bucks. Maybe you went in a thousand or 10 million. I don't know what, what kind of investor you are. And in this one today, I said, hey, it's a green day. I said, take profits or I'll dump on you. No crying later. So again, people are going to ask me this question. You just talked about the fact that there's going to be all this price appreciation and it goes crazy. Why are you talking about profits? Because when we do all this hard work and it goes up 10%, it would behoove you to take a little bit of profits. Does that mean you take 50% out? No, it could be 1%. It could be 20%. I don't, whatever you want to do, it's up to you. I'm just saying, remind yourself that at some point you have to take profits. All you guys can buy super simple. You can buy dips. It's no big deal to you. Where you're going to screw up is not taking the profits. That's all I wanted to say. So sometimes I just say, take some profits just to make sure that you have the muscle memory. So when you do have to do it, it's not too crazy. That was my mistake and I will not make that mistake again. And as a reminder, I do have a lot of Bitcoin. This is my portfolio. I've got a lot of Ethereum, Solana, Near Cardano, Avalanche. Link stacks, Arbitrum, Mutable X, Injectable Cosmos, Polygon, and 67 other cryptos that are out there. I've been around for a long time. I'm an old guy. So that's what's happening. So to sum it all up, what's wrong with Bitcoin? Nothing. What's wrong with Bitcoin is people listening to the wrong people. And that's the big thing. And then lastly, I just want to follow up with a, a little uh, PSA piece on Solana. I don't know if everybody had covered this already, but of course we know Solana went out. People who don't like Solana were dancing on its grave. People who love Solana were like, that's no big deal. I'm just an investor. I don't really marry anything, but uh, this was why. Solana outage was caused by an infinite loop bug previously seen on DevNet. So this was revealed that uh, the known bug had multiple triggers. Developers had only deployed a fix for one of them when the outage occurred. I don't know why they didn't do all of them, but eh, whatever. Latest report provides a technical reason for the outage and states a deploy evict request. I get request cycle of a legacy loader program triggered by an infinite recompile loop in the JIT cache. That almost put me to sleep. Simply put, infinite loop. Great. Latest report also reveals that developers had identified the bug as the cause of an outage on Solana's DevNet one week earlier. So they could have actually prevented this, but I guess they didn't. Developers had already patched one trigger for the bug when the outage occurred and subsequently sped the release of a patch for the second trigger. Well, that's good. Developers intend to release a more complete fix in the future, according to the report. And just for clarity, Solana has experienced nine outages since September 2021. That's a lot with over 150 hours of downtime. But let me ask you this. Like I like Solana and, and, and inevitably someone's going to bring up XRP or Cardano or you know something and say, well, that never goes down. That's true. Never does. It's great. I own all that stuff. But uh, just remember that, you know, if you think like TradFi really cares about something going down that badly, I mean, the traditional stock market goes down if, the, if there's too much price appreciation one way or the other, and it goes down for minutes, hours, or the incomplete trading time period. So it's not like they're like, hey, this is not going to work for us. It just is what it is. And that's it for that. Oh, uh, lastly, lastly, and then we'll get to Q&A. We just did a uh, one of our very rare deep dives over at Dan Degen. So Dan Degen is our second channel where the more risky plays of crypto, we would say, digital assets, things that are just about to launch, we cover them. And when I cover those things over there, you must be 100% aware of this. I invested into it. Everything I talk about, I invest in. I don't talk about anything I don't. So if you ask me a question like, hey, Rob, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? If I don't own it, I don't really know too much about it. But with this one, I invested into this project called Xborg. Essentially, it is a Web3 gaming launchpad and ID protocol. And they've already raised a ton of funds and it looks uh, pretty good. So I invested into it. Also the same people behind Swissborg. 
you can take a, a watch. There's a link in the description. Decide for yourself. But uh, I want to say thanks for the CEO actually coming on and doing a deep dive with me. Because when I went over the pros and cons, I thought he was going to be kind of ticked off. But he's like, I can see that. So check it out. But that's it for today.